Good morning, folks. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk is not focus on the details of the research that was done, and I'm really going to just move to the impacts and the outcomes, what has changed in terms of um, Crown of Thorns control operations on the GBR. So, but the work that I'll be talking about is, it, it draw, or the outcomes draw on the work of all of the research institutions and partners that were part of NESP, UQ, JCU, AIMS, CSIRO, University of Sydney and others. Um, but a really key part of this is that this, all of this work was done as a collaboration with managers and both at the policy level with Gabrumpa, the different departments, but also, and really importantly, with the on-water operators. Without their con constant uh, advice, offered in the friendliest and nicest possible way at all times, as to the re realities on the water compared to in our happy little minds, um, this would not have been nearly as successful a, a piece of work as it has been. So um, I thank particularly the on-water operators, but all of the participants. So when we got involved with Crown of Thorns, um, we came uh, Cameron and I, who I'd like to also acknowledge as a, a really key player in all of this, um, Cameron and I came from the terrestrial realm and uh, we had no marine biology background and so we came with a set of expertise around thinking about how you manage um, biological invasions. When we arrived we looked at this, the state of play on the ground and we made a con really conscious decision that we weren't going to focus on trying to understand the systems and work out the finer details of what, how outbreaks occurred, etc. We we're going to try and focus on the applied question of how you imp would implement uh, management. And we focused on manual control and we did that because at the very outset we had a brief scan of what the potential future control um, opportunities or technologies and there really was nothing that looked like it was on the horizon. So we made a decision that we're going to focus on manual control. And um, Luna in her talk later this morning will go into details about a much broader, more formal review of future technologies. But we did a quick and dirty to start off with and said we need to focus on manual control. And what we did was we looked at the ecology as we understand it, the processes that underpin and drive um, COTS outbreaks, and we looked at the ecology and the constraints of the control, manual control program as it was currently operating. And from that, we identified what we thought would be an appropriate approach to controlling COTS. And we said, we went through at each of the different management scales and said, what are the management actions that are required at this scale what are the decisions managers need to make and what are the tools they need to make those decisions and where are the gaps that we can plug with research in order to allow them to make the decisions and carry out the actions on, the, on water. We decided that we had to start at the scale of the dive and the site because if divers can't control a site, then they can't control a reef and they can't, and if you can't control a reef, you can't control at a regional or broader scales. So we started at that basic building block um, scale and then we worked up, We're focusing on the processes that would allow us to achieve the outcomes we were looking for. Cameron in his talk later on this morning will go into the details of that process. So what I'm going to talk about um, in this first part is really just the performance of the program uh, since we rolled it out across the entire fleet, uh, since we rolled out the IPM approach across the entire fleet. So that started in about 2018 and um, is ongoing today, but I'm going to use data that goes up to July of 2020. A key objective of the program is to reduce COTS at sites and at reefs to below what is termed an ecological threshold. And that threshold is the density of COTS um, above which coral growth can't outpace or keep up with the consumption of coral by crown of thorns. So that's the threshold that has been used in the program to date. I'm actually going to use a different threshold, and that's what I'll call a reproductive threshold. And that's the density at which the reproduction of, of um, COTS is supercharged through enhanced fertilization. And so, and the, essentially by focusing at that 
at that cost density, what we're trying to do, we not only protect coral because it's a more stringent um, threshold, but we reduce the reproductive output, we hope, of a population. And the idea there is not only are we protecting coral, but we're reducing the downstream impact through um, recruitment at, at downstream reefs. So I'm using that as the threshold for measuring success of the program, um, simply because I think it's a better measure for us overall. Oops. Radio. So how well has the program performed? So since 2000, late 2018, the program has operated, um, in that time frame, 2018 to middle of last of 2020, the program had operated at 202 reefs. And oh, it's down here as well. At 99 of those reefs, um, initial mandatos assessed that the, re the reef didn't require any culling. There was, cots densities were too low. 103 of those reefs required culls, and over that time period, at 89 of those uh, reefs, the density of cots across the entire reef perimeter was reduced to below that reproductive threshold. 14 were still in progress at that time. Now, at those reefs, those 103 reefs, we opened up about 884 control sites. These are sites where dives were conducted to actually cull cots, and in that time frame, we finished off 200, 624 of those sites, 260 were still in progress. So an individual site on average took about seven voyages in order to bring it down to below that reproductive threshold. The vast majority of sites actually required fewer than that, but there is a long tail there of recalcitrant sites where it was just really difficult to get rid of the cots. Similarly, at reefs, it required on the order of 14 um, voyages to visit a reef before it, the entire perimeter was brought down. But there are some reefs which we just can't seem to uh, solve the problem at. So there's two, well, one reef in particular where I think we're up to over 50 voyages now and still going. But in general, it takes just a couple of voyages to bring a reef down to below the threshold. If you look at all of the sites at a reef, whether they were closed or you know, finished up and brought below the threshold or not, if you look at the change in the density um, from when we arrived at the, at the reef to the last time we visited the reef, you see it goes from a mean density of 19 cots per hectare down to less than one cots per hectare on the program. So overall, we're managing to well below the ecological threshold and actually to well below the reproductive threshold as well. So I think that suggests that things are going pretty well in terms of the program. But I should point out that, and I think I can go back, there were 99 reefs where we didn't actually do, or I say the, I'm saying we, they, the people who know what they're actually doing in the field, there were 99 reefs where they didn't actually dive. They made a decision based on a rule of thumb um, not to dive there. And it's really important for us to know whether that was a good decision. Because if they decided not to dive at a reef and it actually had high densities, not only would you be losing coral at that reef, but you'd be providing lava in, um, to the downstream reefs. So that would be a very expensive mistake for the program. What we're able to do with the data is um, we had a, about 100 odd reefs where, where we dived, sorry, we had about 30 reefs where no, the decision rule would have said do not dive here, but dives were conducted anyway, and those happen for a variety of reasons. And that's really nice because that allows us to test how reliable our decision rule is. So in the first instance, the really important decision is if, we, if the decision rule says don't dive here, uh, is, that, are we, is, is the decision rule, rule reliable enough? And from the 30 reefs where that, um, or 33 reefs, sorry, where we dived despite not needing to, what we found was 97% of those reefs did not require a dive. The cots densities were well below the threshold. 3% of those reefs, it did require a dive. So that's telling us that that decision rule is reliable. It's 97% reliable, it's not perfect, but that's pretty good. The less expensive, the cheap um, mistake to make is that you dive at a reef when you don't need to. And what we found, what that bottom um, line and the, or section of the table is showing is that, yeah, we make that mistake quite often. And the vessel operators will, their blood pressure will rise when I say that's a cheap mistake and we can afford to make that, to dive when we don't need to. But 
from it, from the control program perspective in terms of outcomes, that's okay. We lose some investment, but for the operators, that's a waste of time and energy. So we essentially what we end up with is a pretty good balance, I think, from my perspective. We very rarely make the costly mistakes. We fairly frequently make the affordable mistakes. We'd like to make the affordable mistake less often, but at this stage of the game, the, pro the decision rules are working pretty well. And we're detecting COTS densities well below the critical thresholds quite reliably. So one of the big things is the program's working well, but has it improved over what we were doing previously? If we look at the COT, at COTS control since 2013 on the GBR, we can see we can identify three phases. There was a period from 2013 to 2015 where the control program was just going out and going back gangbusters. They had 53 sites that at 21 um, focal focal reefs. That's where they were intending to control COTS down to below threshold levels. But in reality, they had a, a bit of a focus on those reefs, but they distributed their effort essentially wherever high densities of COTS were reported, and they conducted no general surveillance. So they were just going out there and focusing on killing as many COTS as they could at high density sites. From 2016, we went through a transition period where we gradually started to introduce the IPM rules, and then, as I outlined earlier, we introduced the IPM program across the entire fleet in late 2018. And so what I'll do in this next section is compare that pre-IPM 2013 to 2015 with the IPM phase and look at differences in performance. And in this table, what, you've got, what I've got in the dark blue are a series of performance metrics. And they come, I've categorised them there on the right-hand side um, according to the kinds of objectives that they fulfil. The top block of, a, of metrics are essentially metrics that are focused on ach achieving the maximum body count, killing as many cots as possible. The, the next couple of blocks underneath that in the table are the performance metrics associated with achieving the kinds of objectives that we actually really want to achieve in the program. We don't hate COTS, we want to protect coral. So our primary objective is not actually body count, maximising a body count, it's actually protecting coral. And so that's what those metrics focus at, on. So in the pre-IPM program around the, the body count metrics, what we can see is that the pre-IPM program focused on sites that had really high COTS densities, over 30 COTS per hectare compared to 10 for the IPM program. And they culled at a much greater rate, over 300, 360 COTS per day on average um, compared to 160 COTS per day on average. But while they might have focused, so that indicates they're focusing on sites which have much higher COTS densities, but they're achieving, when they achieve the objective, they're achieving it at a pretty much the same rate as the IPM program. They're removing about 90% of the COTS at the site. Um, but when you come to the other objectives, what you can see is that they don't perform nearly as well. So it takes more than two and a half times as long to achieve the, um, the threshold uh, to cull down to the threshold at a site under the IPM approach than it did under the, um, uh, sorry, under the pre-IPM approach than it did under the IPM approach. And that means that you'd lose, if you assume COTS are eating coral at a relatively constant rate, that would suggest you're losing about 60% more coral before you achieve your objective under the pre-IPM approach to what you do under the IPM approach. And the probability of reaching that objective, um, that threshold is, under the pre-IPM approach was roughly half that it was under the IPM approach. The pre-IPM approach reduced densities on average to roughly four times the, the key thresholds, whereas under the IPM approach, it reduced it to below the reproductive threshold, and about 88% compared to 53% of sites reached that threshold under the IPM approach. The critical thing is what do we achieve at the scale of a reef? Under the pre-IPM approach, we achieved, the, we achieved those thresholds at 0% of uh, reefs at the scale of the entire reef perimeter, whereas under the IPM approach, we achieved it at 92% of the reefs. So that's a dramatic improvement in the performance of the program. And essentially what the IPM has done has taken a really 
efficient way of killing COTS and turned it into an efficient way of achieving control program objectives. So what might be achieved in the next outbreak? How much, how long do I have? Is no answer, so I can go for as long as I want. Excellent. Um, what, how well might we, so how good might this particular tool be in addressing the next outbreak of COTS? Um, and can we scale it up? And can we, what might we achieve there? Could we actually stop an outbreak? Or might we be able to really modify its magnitude and, and spread? But we can use the data from the control program to have a look at that, a first pass at that. But to do that, we need to answer a couple of questions. And the first is, when do we want to start controlling the next outbreak? And I'm going to suggest that we want to do that before COTS densities reach that reproductive threshold, because that's when it's going to be... E the populations will be smallest, the reproductive output will be smallest. That's when we're likely to have the greatest impact. Where do we want to do that? History would tell us that we should focus on the initiation box. That's where we know the outbreak is... Um, or it's where, it's where the outbreak has been first detected in the last four iterations. But we also know that, uh, you know, if you look at the Vanatalo data, it might actually have occurred a little bit further north. And even if, it, if that initiation box is where it always starts, um, in, invasion biology theory will tell us that actually we can't just focus on that outbreaking population, we need to focus on the area where it might be dispersing um, larvae to. And Sven Utica's data gives us an indication of how far those larvae might be spreading. It's not perfect, but it's a pretty, you know, it's a good start to um, giving us a scale of what that might look like. So we would say you need to focus your efforts in the, in the initiation box, but also on either side of the initiation box in what I'll call the dispersal box. This is, and those boxes are marked on that map there. And this is conveniently a really good place on the GBR for us to focus our activities because it's the area with the fewest reefs and the smallest reef area. So just physically, it's best scale to the, um, to the control program. So how, do, how might our efforts scale to the, the area that we'd be dealing with in that combined initiation and dispersal box? On average, over that um, period, 2018 to 2020, the a single, the average um, control vessel on the water worked at 23 and a half reefs. They towed about just under a thousand kilometres, and they conducted culls at about 12 reefs. <coughs> excuse me, at about 12 reefs, and closed or su was successful at 11 of those. And they culled over about a thousand hectares. Um, if you you can then multiply those numbers up by the number of vessels, and then the number of years that you might expect that the outbreak would be resident within the initiation and outbreak boxes, and as you can see, they turn into quite large numbers. So we have a pretty, you know, the potential is pretty good. How does it scale to that um, initiation and dispersal box area? So here, I've, in terms of reef area, I've had to change the metric that I'm using. In that previous slide, I showed you the actual area controlled but we don't know what reefs are going to outbreak and what actual control would happen at the scale of the dispersal boxes. So what I've done is I've then translated that number into the mapped area of those reefs and extrapolated that so I could compare it with the in initiation and dispersal boxes directly. And essentially what you can see there is there's 605 reefs in that combined initiation and dispersal box and over four year, over the four year residency time, the control program would work at about 470 reefs. But they'd be managing an area, reef area, that is roughly twice what the reef area within the initiation and dispersal boxes, and a perimeter that's about two and a half times the perimeter that uh, was in those area, in the initiation and dispersal boxes. It's a pretty simple extrapolation. It makes a lot of assumptions, but the take home message I think is that we should be really optimistic because the scale of the problem, if we catch it in that particular area, is not completely mismatched to the potential, the scale or the capacity of the program as it currently stands. So I think, just to summarise all of that, I think some of the key impacts that we've made in this, in this area is really to shift the focus away from the scientific questions, understanding the processes in, in all of their glorious detail, stuff that we still need to do at some point, but to really focus down and say, 
how can we actually meet this challenge here and now with the tools that are available? Um, so in this program, we've provided a really solid strategic operational foundation for COTS control going forward. And I think we can claim that we've transformed the way con COTS control operations um, are conducted on the GBR now. We've now got an efficient and effective means of, of uh, achieving our objectives. Um, a lot of one of the big complaints about manual control is that it's so expensive. And it's true, it is expensive. But you need to think about it in the context of the value of the asset. It costs about 0.2% of the, t the annual value of our asset to run this control program in its current format. And if, you don't, if you're not willing to invest 0.2% of the return on your asset per year, then you probably don't deserve to be, you know, to, ho to hold that asset. So I, the program is actually very cheap for what it can achieve at this stage of the game. And it, I think it shows really strong potential for being able to meet the challenge of the next outbreak. It's going to need to change even further and arguably even more dramatically in order to do that successfully. But I think it can do it. And I think what we've done so to date has laid the foundation to make that possible. So thank you.